Hey, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Let's get ready to pray. Instead of getting ready to rumble, hallelujah. Praise God Almighty. Hallelujah. In this corner, we have the Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the great and mighty one and only begotten Son of the Father. Hallelujah. Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. Hallelujah. And in the other corner, we have the loser, Satan, the enemy of our souls. Hallelujah. The accuser of the brethren, the slanderer. Hallelujah. And the fight has already been won, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Imagine, brothers and sisters, when it says in the Bible that the, you know, the, 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 the people are the princes, you know, these principalities, they killed, you know, not knowing that they killed the, the Lord of glory. You know, Satan entered Judas, and Judas was used by Satan to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. There's lots of people. There was this preacher when I first started. I was the, one of the first times I preached at, one, at, uh, at a church that I helped start, another church. This was uh, historically, you know, everyone there was uh, black but me. Those of you who watch my videos, you know that I, uh, by the grace of God, I started uh, three Filipino churches, and I helped start a church It was... Um, you know, black people and myself is the Lord prepared me for the mission work in the Philippines. But anyhow, that pastor, it's a friend of mine, Brother Billy, Pastor Billy, um, he was telling me he thought that Satan knew that Jesus was supposed to be crucified. No, I don't, I don't agree with that because if the, Satan had known, of course, why would he help fulfill God's word he didn't know that so when Satan like in a boxing match you know when the Lord went down Satan thought he had won you know and uh, one time we did an interpretive thing for Christmas at one of the Filipino churches and we had it where we played the song Carmen the Champion and uh, what happened is is that uh, I actually played you know the father in the in the in the little action scene we did for the song the champion is that and that's what we're talking about here is, is the lord is leading me to think of that song that the countdown is in reverse you know instead of counting to 10 and then declaring that the lord jesus christ had lost in the song the champion by carmen the lord begins to count back the father begins to count backwards 10 nine eight and then satan is like what do you what's why are you counting backwards wait a minute stop stop god stop at the end of course the lord is resurrected hallelujah so the battle's already been won brothers and sisters the battle's already won jesus christ is risen and the work's already done so praise the lord he can work with those who praise him praise the lord god inhabits praise praise the lord for those chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you they'll drop powerless behind you when you praise him hallelujah praise the lord hallelujah he can work with those who praise him praise the lord hallelujah god inhabits praise praise the lord those chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you They'll drop powerless behind you when you praise Him. Hallelujah. You've got to praise Him. Praise His name. Hallelujah. What, look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise, which He literally did. <laughs> it's not just the words of the song. A lot of people might sing that song. Is it really true? Are they singing this in the church or in some kind of organized deal? Or is it really that the, He's put a song of praise in this heart of mine god is good god is good all the time hallelujah evil sinners so unworthy but for us he chose to die he filled us with his holy spirit so we can stand and testify that his love is everlasting and his mercy and of his mercies there shall be no end god is good i know i keep singing that song brothers and sisters but i don't know what to tell you as the another song says when the spirit of the lord is in my heart i'll dance like david did you know that king david brothers and sisters 
when they brought the ark from Shiloh to bring it to the city after King David became king and all that. He wanted to bring the ark up to the city of Jerusalem from where it had been kept in Shiloh. And while he was bringing it and they finally got it to Jerusalem, there's a whole story of that where it was they tried once and someone was killed and then they had to do it again because uh, they touched the ark and they were unclean. And the next time they, they were bringing it and King David put on just a, a cloth ephod it's called he just wore like a little like a little gown thing and danced in front of the ark and uh he was the king and some people were you know trying to mock him and, and and all this kind of stuff some of the descendants of king saul but king david because he loved god that's why he's a man after god's own heart brothers and sisters that's why we see even though he sinned against god i've talked about this before he sinned against god here he was the king and he had you know, several wives and all these concubines and all this stuff. And But yet, one night, he saw the wife. He was walking on the roof. That's what they used to do. they go out there, and I could probably still do it in Israel. Walking on the roof of his house. You know, there's no air conditioning and all that. It's hot. Go up there at night on the roof, and he looked across, and he saw the wife of one of his generals taking a bath. And his general was in the field leading the army. King David stayed back, and he saw Bathsheba. And he called for her to be brought to him. He knew that was one of his general's wives. And he slept with her. And then she became pregnant. He tried to get the husband to come back and sleep with his wife so he would think it was his child. He, he tried several different times to get him to do it. The general wouldn't do it. So he had the general killed. And then after the man died, and then he took Bathsheba to be his wife. And then the prophet Nathan came to him and said, King, there's, King David, there's a problem going on in your kingdom, and, and you need to judge. And he said, what is that? He said, there's a man who has many sheep. He's wealthy. He has lots of sheep. And then there's a man that's only got one sheep. And then the man killed the man and took his sheep. What should we do to that man? What should be done to him? Render your judgment, O King David. King David said, you know, that man needs to be killed. And then Nathan said to him, Nathan the prophet, you know, speaking by the power of God, said, that man is you, King David. You are the one. You have all these wives and you have all this concubines and all this money and all the wealth and you're the king and then you took the man who had one wife who was not, a, a, you know, not the king and you took his wife. King David repented of that. Written in, recorded in Psalm 51. Create in me, God, a, you know, restore in me, O Lord, a pure heart. You know, he repents of his sins calls upon the Lord. That's why David is a man after God's own heart. Not that he was perfect. By no means. He committed adultery with one of his general's wife while the general was in the field and then had the man killed. Ordered that he be put in the front so he would be killed. Took his wife. Anyway, brothers and sisters, I was trying to remember his name. It's Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite was the general that he had killed. But brothers and sisters... The point of the story is not all those, because you know, especially when I first started on YouTube, I make videos and people like to, you know, get involved in all those details. That, you know, of course, that's true. We, you know, we read the story, we know what's in there. But the message, brothers and sisters, the message that the Lord has put in my heart to share with you today, is not all those details about the names of the people and all that, but that King David, as an example, was a man after God's own heart. God said that David was a man after his own heart. David was not a tall person when he was a teenager and the Lord sent Samuel there because see the people demanded a king God said I don't want to give you a king I'm your king and then they demanded a king so he really showed them by you know picking having the prophet Samuel pick King Saul who was a head taller than everybody it said you know he's a good looking guy great big guy and all this but guess what he was a horrible king and he disobeyed God and caused all kinds of problems Refused to obey God. So God said, I'm going to get a man after my own heart. And I'm going to end the, the, you know, King Saul's children. Son will not be the king. This will be the end of his kingdom. And I'll give the kingdom to another bloodline. A man who's after my own heart. And so when Samuel the prophet went to Bethlehem, King David was from Bethlehem, just like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why when it was time for Jesus to be born, his father or his earthly supposed, you know, uh, stepfather Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem because that was the city of David and they were descendants of King David. So they went there for the census that the Caesar was doing at that time. So Bethlehem, Hebrew for house of bread. You know, Jesus is the bread of life. And um, there's an FYI there. So 
in Bethlehem of Judea. There's another Bethlehem in Israel. That's why it's the real name, Bethlehem of Judea. Only about seven, I think it's about seven kilometers from Jerusalem. So it's pretty close. But in those days, that was a long way. So Samuel went there secretly without telling King Saul, even though he'd already rebuked King Saul a bunch of times and prophesied God's going to take the kingdom from you and all this stuff. He went there because he knew, of course, that King Saul would want to kill the person who God called, just like Herod wanted to kill the babies born, you know, that were under two years old there in Bethlehem to try to kill the king of kings, just like they did with Moses, the Pharaoh did with Moses, trying to kill that seed that would overthrow their power. You can see that connection there. And so, um, anyhow, so in Bethlehem, he went to the house of Jesse. God told him to go to the house of Jesse. David is the son of Jesse. Um, Jesus is the root and offspring of Jesse. Um, and so, uh, being the root means the, the, the source and the branch. So, you know, the Lord is the Alpha and Omega. He's the root and the offspring of Jesse, who's the father of King David. So, Samuel went to the house of King David, the future King David, and the man had many sons. And he saw the first son, usually like the firstborn, great big tall guy and handsome guy. So this must be the one. This must be the Lord's anointed. This is going to be the new king. And the Lord said, nope, it's not him. And he looked at all those brothers in the house. Nope, that's not him. That's not him. And then the Lord said to Samuel, you know, man looks at the outward appearance like King Saul being a head taller than everybody. But God, he, God is saying to Samuel, I look at the heart. I look at the heart of a man. I judge a man by what's in his heart. King David is a man after my own heart, the future King David. So after he went through each one, and this is not him, this is not him, not him. It's like seven of them. And then he asked Jesse, do you have any more sons? He said, well, yeah, I've got my youngest son. You know, he's like a teenager. He's out, you know, watching the flock of sheep. So when Samuel went out there, that was him. That was God's anointed, and God had Samuel to anoint him. He became the king. God already knew what was in his heart. God knew he was a worshiper. What made David great? He wrote most of the Psalms that are really songs. I call them Psalms, but they're written as songs. David was the king, but yet he worshiped God. So the symbol of David is what? A lot of people forget or they don't know. The symbol of David is the harp. When he was a young man and he received the anointing of God, God made a way that it ended up working for King Saul. And King Saul, God sent... People think that God, a lot of things about God they don't know. If they'd read the Bible, they'd see a lot of things about God they didn't know. God sent an unclean spirit to torment King Saul because of his wickedness, his disobedience, his evilness. And that wicked spirit would torment King Saul, but he would call for David, who was still, like I said, a young man at that time, to play his harp for him. And when King David, under the power of the Holy Spirit on him, he would play that harp. The evil spirit would flee from King Saul, and then he would be able to have peace and rest. So God was just showing him, this young guy who looks like a nobody, he's the one, he's the one. Now, when they, that was at the time, and they, you know, in the same time frame as David and Goliath, the story. So here's another example. See how people, especially Saul, obviously relied on his size. So when King David was a teenager still, but he had been anointed by Samuel, he was secretly the king, or he was going to be the king, already anointed and chosen by God, but nobody else knew it. He was sent there to bring food to his brothers who were in the army waiting to fight the Philistines. And then Goliath was there. And King David, the future King David, he went there. And he, you know, by the power of God, you know, I'm not going through the whole thing because that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about him being a worshiper of God. But he, you know, he called out and said, you know, he said to his brothers, you know, who is this, you know, uncircumcised Philistines to challenge the army of the living God? You know, I've got several sermons to, that cross over from different directions on this story uh, of that. and But anyway, so what King Saul did was he called David because he said, the man who does this, they won't pay any more taxes and all this kind of stuff. There was rewards. So, you know, David went to see him and then said he would do it. And, you know, so King Saul said, here, put on my armor and carry my sword. Now, as I told you, David was a short person. He was still young. They say he was about 17, they think. The Bible doesn't say. Uh, but he was a young man, probably a teenager, 
and short, and then here's King Saul, a head taller than everybody. So you can imagine his armor was way too big for David. David had never worn armor. He had never used a sword. I mean, he wasn't a warrior like that. He had used a dagger, and he had used his sling and a bow. He said, you know, he had killed the lion and, and the bear with a, with a sling and a bow. And so that's what he knew how to use. He didn't know how to use a sword and all that kind of stuff. He didn't know how to wear armor. And it was 10 times too big for him, you know. So King Saul was making a mockery of him. And it also showed that the things that King Saul had because he was a big guy and all that, it didn't mean nothing. I mean, here's the giant who Saul was afraid of. Obviously, they didn't kill the giant for how many days he'd come out. I forgot, is it 30 days or something? He came out every day and challenged them. And they were all afraid and hiding. His brothers, the King Saul and all the people of Israel were hiding Instead of relying on God, they were relying on their big armor, but they weren't using it. So here's David with a, with a slingshot. He says, I'll go out there and, and kill this guy. You know, God's going to give him into my hand. He even went out there and proclaimed it. He went out there and proclaimed to the giant, God's going give to you, give you into my hand, and you, you know, the birds of the air is going to eat your flesh. I'm going to chop off your head, is what he said. <laughs> that's what David told him. And, uh, you know, that's a whole other story. But the, the coolest part about the story, after David proclaimed what he was going to do by faith under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it says he ran toward the giant. Can you imagine that? He ran toward the giant. Here he's a little guy with a slingshot. And here's this, you know, warrior champion of the Philistines. He runs toward him. You know, that's faith and the anointing of God that was on him and a man after God's own heart. So... You know, there's all kinds of stuff. Like I said, I go in all these different directions with it, but that's not the message. The message is King David was a man after God's own heart. That's why God loved him. That's why God blessed him. That's why God gave him the blessing that his first, you know, his natural seed of the generation after him would build the temple. King Solomon, who, by the way, the son of the woman that he committed adultery with, who he killed the husband, Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba, who became one of his wives wasn't his first wife. It was like his fourth or fifth wife, whatever. Then her son, way down the line, he had a bunch of sons, a whole bunch of sons. But yet Solomon, the son of the woman he committed adultery with, Bathsheba, he became the king and became the wisest man in all the world, the wealthiest man in all the history of the world, and had peace for 40 years, expanding the kingdom and all this, and was one of the greatest kingdoms, you know, in ancient history. Because God was honoring David. And then God further honored David by allowing that the Messiah would come through his bloodline. That's when Jesus walked to earth. People, you know, some of the people, one of the titles of Messiah is Hosanna to the son of David. The Greek word is, you know, victory to the son of David. And they called him the son of David. It's one of the titles that the Israelites were giving to the Messiah, the son of David. Even though he's, you know, what the Lord said, I mean, he's real, literally, you know, he is the natural. As I said, he's the root and offspring of Jesse. So, of course, the offspring of Jesse is all, you know, David's offspring is also the offspring of his father and his father and his father. So Jesus is the offspring of King David in the flesh, but he's also the son of God. That's why when the Pharisees came to him and, they, and the Sadducees and the Herodians, they kept trying to challenge the Lord and ask him all kinds of questions to try to trip him up. Jesus finally got rid of them and showed them that he was the son of God with his wisdom Besides all the miracles and all the other stuff he did, he showed them his wisdom by the word of God many times, but he finally put an end to their attempts to trip him up with the word of God. When they, when they came to him and he said, tell me the Messiah, is he the son of David? And uh, they said, yeah, oh yes, uh, the Messiah is the son of David. And then Jesus said, well, why David himself, King David, speaking by the spirit of God, said, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make the enemies thy footstool. If David called him Lord, how is he then his son? That's what Jesus asked the, the, the Pharisees. And when they heard that, they didn't ask him any more questions after that. That was the last time, you know, Jesus put an end to their little silly questions about should you pay taxes and should you stone the woman that's taken in adultery? All those little things they did to try to, you know, to trip up the Lord and get him to say something against the Caesar, get him to say something you know, against the temple and against the law and all that stuff. That's what they were trying to do so they could accuse him, so they could crucify him. But they never did find an excuse to crucify him, so they just started making stuff up. But anyway, brothers and sisters, that was in Psalm 110, I believe it's verse 1, where it's where David, King David, speaking by the Spirit of God, said, The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand, until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Hallelujah. And that day, brothers and sisters, that day that the, is alluded to, spoken by the Spirit of God through King David, is when the Messiah, Yeshua, the Christ, Jesus, returns this earth. It says he'll 
The earth will be his footstool. He'll rule them with a rod of iron. The Lord is coming back as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Brothers and sisters, you know, you know, I've done so many videos and all the preaching I've been doing since the year 2000 and since January 2001, it's been a call to holiness, a call to righteousness, a call to come up here and sit with the Lord as it says in Ephesians that we're seated with Him in heavenly places far above, far above all powers and principalities and forces of darkness in high places. We're already seated with Christ in heavenly places, brothers and sisters. And there's so few people, so few people that take advantage of the fact of the better covenant we have. It says in Hebrews, we have a better covenant. So many people that are carnal-minded Christians, not spiritual-minded. You know, you can say things. I was just thinking about it today. As I mentioned, every time I mention quoting the Bible now, for one thing, you quote in the Bible. Even if you don't understand it, it's the Bible. It says it cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That's why the Lord was crucified on the cross because it says cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree from the Old Testament and the law of Moses. And it says in Peter, 2 Peter 2.24, you know, he became sin for us. You know, for his written is cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree and all these things, you know. He took our sins and disease. He became sin for us. Every time I mention that, someone will ask me, I thought Jesus was crucified on a cross, not on a tree. It's just such the example that came in my mind today as I was, you know, just meditating on on the on, on the body of Christ and you know in the church and the work that God would give me in His church to help perfect the saints. Ephesians four eleven. I thought about how, that example of people having eyes but not see and and ears but they cannot hear they cannot see things the way god sees things that's the vision and the mission of this youtube channel is that people can see as god sees and hear as god hears and this is such a one of the lowest levels just like jesus said in john chapter 3 to nicodemus when he told nicodemus john chapter 3 3 he said that before a man can enter the kingdom of heaven, he must be born again. And then Nicodemus said to the Lord, what you mean to be born again? I must go, you know, someone must go back into their mother's womb again. And then Jesus said, you're a leader in Israel and you don't understand this. Here he was, one of the Sanhedrin. There's only 70 of them. Sanhedrin means 70. 70 leaders of elders. And he was known as, you know, Gamaliel. And then was the greatest teacher. And Nicodemus was a great teacher and an elder of the 70 highest ranking elders in, 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 the, in, in Judaism, in Jerusalem. He didn't know that. And Jesus said, if you can't understand these earthly things, getting saved is an earthly thing. Jesus said, if you can't understand these earthly things, how can we tell you about heavenly things? If you can't understand these earthly things, even the gospel, how can you understand all the things going on in heaven and all that? And, and, and all these complicated things about the rapture and the end times and, and the glory of God and, and, and the throne of God or whatever and all, any kind of thing you want to talk about, spiritual stuff. In heavenly things, you can't understand the gospel. That by grace are we saved through faith, not of our own, but a gift of God. Not by works of any man of boast. And that when God sees a piece of wood, you know, he has an ear, let him hear. In Jude, the Bible says that the blood of Jesus, you know, has a better word than the blood of Abel. And back in Genesis, when Cain slew Abel, that text from Jude was referring that the blood of Jesus had a better message than the blood of Abel. Back in the beginning of Genesis chapter 3 and 4, in that area where Cain killed Abel, God came to Cain and said, where is thy brother? Cain said, I'm in my, my brother's keeper. I don't know where he is. And then God said, the blood of your brother Abel cries out to me. See, everything has a frequency. Let's, let's, let's connect it to something that, that people can understand in the scientific kind of stuff. Everything has a frequency. DNA has a frequency. Every one of us has a different frequency. Every tree has a different frequency. Everything has a different frequency, and God can hear it. 
God can hear that. Obviously, He created. That's why. He said, the blood of Abel cries out to me. And then the blood of Jesus has a better report than the blood of Abel. That's why it says, he who has an ear, let him hear. So when God sees a cross, it's a tree. A cross was made out of wood, which comes from a tree. Now this is an earthly thing. Seeing an earthly thing is the way God sees it. It's a tree. That's why God said that in the law. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. It's made of wood. Hallelujah. He who has an ear, let him hear that you can... What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that as we worship God and get closer to God and go higher in God, we can develop an ear to hear. It's not the, the, a revelation that a tree is made out of wood. The revelation is, is to see things the way God sees it. See yourself the way God sees you. See your problems the way God sees them. As I've told you guys many times, walk down the streets of Manhattan. Look at all those tall buildings. Like people's problems. Way big. Mountains. Go in an airplane and fly over the top of New York. And see all of those skyscrapers, you know, Trump Tower and all that, whatever. Empire State Building. Looks like it's about that tall from the airplane. A car looks like an ant. People you can't even see, probably, you know, walking down the street when you're way up there, 35, 40,000 feet. Such it is. Let me explain it further for those who don't have an ear. What I'm saying is when you get close to God and you go high in the Lord, it's just like that. You see your problems the way God sees them. You see that they're just like an ant. They're nothing. You know? Like the ant that moved the rubber tree plant. Any of you guys ever watched Laverne and Shirley? They used to always sing that song. I, I can't remember the name, and I guess it's accentuate the positive, whatever it was. But anyway, brothers and sisters, if you have the Spirit of the Lord in your heart, you'll dance like David did. If you have the Spirit of the Lord in your heart, you have an ear to hear and eyes to see. How do you get that? As I told you in the beginning, by the Spirit of God, as soon as I started this video, I started singing the song, Praise the Lord. The Lord put that in my mouth. These songs are not just being sang to be cute, funny, and fresh. They're part of the Word of God and the message from God. He has an ear, let him hear. Praise the Lord. He can work with those who praise Him. Praise the Lord. You know, those chains that seem to bind you. See, it's all in your mind, in the natural mind. Those, your problems are tall, but it's sad. I just want to say this. It's so sad I have to relate to people's problems because when they think about themselves, they'll take the effort. When it's all about them, they'll take the effort to receive what I'm saying. That's what people want. That's why they love Joel Osteen. He says something about you. Like he wrote a book, How to Be a Better You. Never mentions the word, the name of God or, or the Lord Jesus Christ or nothing in the book. It's all about how to be a better you. That's what people love to hear. I d try my best to not, to not go in that way. Talk about you. Talk about the Lord. Jesus. People don't even want to think about the Lord. It's all about what's the Lord going to do for them. You know, God is here to, to make us happy, to bless us, to give us joy, and all those things. When those things are just a fruit of our relationship with the Lord. We're not supposed to be looking after the fruit. We're supposed to be looking to the fruit giver. Look to the root, not to the fruit. Look to the fruit giver. Don't look for uh, uh, you know, healing. Look for the healer. In the process of your relationship with the healer, you'll be healed. In the process of your relationship with the giver, you'll receive. He'll give you everything you need. People are chasing after the hand of God instead of seeking His face. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Seek His face. Seek His face. As I quote all the time, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people who call by my name would humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways and seek my face. That means seek the person of the Lord. Seek the Lord Himself. And not be seeking, you know, after signs and wonders or after answered prayer or whatever it is about you, 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 you. But when you see things the way God sees them, those mountains, you know, be thou removed and cast in the sea. You see that mountain is this little anthill. You can move. 
the rubber tree out of the road by the power of God and the grace of God because it's nothing. It's all, it, like I'm saying from that psalm, those chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you God allows those things to put you through the trials and tests to get you where you need to be. And that's a whole other sermon. It's like with King David. You know, when King David went to go kill the giant, he told King Saul, well, I killed, I use, you know, I don't need your armor. I use my sling. I use my sling and my and, and a staff and I killed whatever, the bow and sling, whatever it is, to kill the bear and then the lion and now I would use the same thing to kill the giant. And that's what he told Goliath. So, in order to prepare him to kill Goliath, he killed the lion and the bear. And to prepare him to be king, he killed the giant. You know, so, and Joseph, that's another one. He's a great example too. Well, of course, we're talking about King David in this story, but Joseph also. He had a dream that his family would bow down to him. He'd be a great ruler, but instead he was sold into slavery. He was put it, then he, and then he was falsely accused of raping a woman, put into prison. And then later on, he became the leader and ascended to the right hand of Pharaoh. But he went through all that process to get there. And, and, and he stayed, remained faithful to God. And that's what God's looking for. King David, when he did stray, which King David did sin against God with Bathsheba. And as he said in that Psalm 51, against you only have I sinned. And that's what the right thing. That's the right thing you need to remember. When you sin, it's against God. And people get that in their head. Stop worrying about what people think. That's the reason why Joel Austin and all these people uh, are doing such a great job because they're people pleasers. They're worried about what people think. Worried about pleasing people. But we don't worry. If you want to walk with God, you want to walk in revival, you want to walk in the power of God and holiness and all those things, be used by God in a mighty way. You have to be a God pleaser only. That's why King David said against you only have I sinned. He didn't sin against nobody else but God. When we sin, it's against God. Our trespasses against God. Our sins against God when we sin. God's, it's God the one who we're sinning against. Not sinning against people. People would say, you know, I was just going to say, I was just thinking that some people might say, well, you know, Joel Osteen's successful. Well, the Mormons have millions of people too, and it's a cult. Jehovah's Witnesses have millions of people. It's a cult. You know, Islam has a... a, a you know, a billion point, 1.2 billion people, but it's a cult and it's evil and wicked. It's not of God, it's from, from the devil. So just because something is successful doesn't mean it's from God. As a matter of fact, it's, Jesus was born in a manger. King David was a shepherd boy until he became the king. Joseph was sold into slavery and then into prison, then became the right hand of the viceroy of Egypt is what his title was in, in modern English. Jesus was born in a manger. Brothers and sisters, I pray that you have the heart and mind of Christ, that God would fill you with His Holy Spirit, that you would be a, a man or a woman after the heart of God. Let's pray. Let's worship the Lord. I'm coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the things I've made it, but it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Michael W. Smith song. It's all about Jesus. Come back to the heart of worship. Worship the Lord. Praise the Lord. Get out of your flesh and get over in the spirit realm. Pray that God would touch you. I'm going to pray for you right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah is Hebrew for praise Yahweh. Lord, we praise you, Lord, we praise you, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we praise you, Lord, we praise you. Father, I ask you to bless your people, Lord God. Bless your people, Lord God, just like King David, those who repent, Lord God. We say against you only have we sinned, Lord God. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Create in us, O oh God, a pure heart. Renew in us. Restore a right spirit 
within us, Lord God. It's like Psalm 24, you know, give us clean hands, give us a pure heart, that we might not lift our souls to another. Hallelujah. Father, we bless your name. Oh, Lord, my God, we praise you today. Lord, we enthrone you, Lord. We proclaim you are King. Standing here in the midst of us, we lift you up with our praise. And as we worship, build your throne. And as we worship, build your throne. Come, Lord Jesus, and take your place. Hallelujah, Lord God. We worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. We worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what we long to do. And we give you praise. Hallelujah. For you are our righteousness. Hallelujah, Lord God. We praise you, Lord. We bless you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your Word. I thank you for your only begotten Son. We thank you for the blood of Yeshua. We thank you for the cruel cross of Calvary, as they say. Lord, we thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, Lord Jesus, that saved a wretch like us, Lord God. We once were lost, but now we're found. We're blind, but now we see. Indescribable uncontainable you set the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing god hallelujah lord you're amazing you are amazing god hallelujah we bless you lord we thank you for your loving kindness lord we thank you for the gospel thank you father hallelujah thank you god through whom all blessings flow we thank you all of us creatures here below. We thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless brothers and sisters. Praise God Almighty. I'll see all you, the brothers and sisters. I'll be meeting St. Augustine this next weekend, next Friday, all day Friday and Friday night, which is September the 16th. In the morning of September the 17th, I'll be meeting with brothers and sisters in St. Augustine, Florida. Contact me. I'll be having a meeting at 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. Friday. The rest of the time is meeting one-on-one. -on -one. Contact me, near to Christ AOL.com. My email is below every video, near to Christ at AOL.com. Then Saturday night, the 17th, Columbia, South Carolina. Hallelujah. Contact me. If you're going to be in Columbia, South Carolina, 7 p.m. until... The job is done on Sunday evening, or Saturday evening, 17th of September, Columbia, South Carolina. Contact me if you want to meet me there, near to Christ, N-E-A-R-T-O-C-H-R-I-S-T at AOL.com. Praise God, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. God bless you all. Love you all. See you soon. Aloha.